The Property Pod. 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 Welcome to The Property Pod with MoneyWeb. The property sector is an ever-changing sector. And in this podcast series, your host, Suren Naidu, chats to movers and shakers in the property industry. Hi there and welcome to The Property Pod, South Africa's premier property investor podcast. My name is Suren Naidu, and on this weekly MoneyWeb show, we gain insider insights from leading executives, analysts, developers, and entrepreneurs in the country's expansive property industry. My next guest on our Leading Women in Property series for Women's Month on the podcast is Jess Moyer. She's a familiar face in the African commercial real estate sector, But if you don't recognize the surname, you may recognize her as Jess Cleland and part of the Brow Property Group for a long time. Jess is back in South Africa and settling in the mother city and has a new position at Cushman and Wakefield Brow as Director for Strategy and Research. Jess, a very warm welcome to the Property Pod. Thanks so much, Lorraine. It's great to be here, especially during Women's Month. You're probably one of the most experienced women execs in African commercial real estate, having worked, um, you know, in the group in South Africa, Kenya, Mauritius. Those are the countries I'm aware of. Tell us about your work across the continent, uh, a little bit of history of what you've been up to over the last uh, few years. Sure. So I actually spent 12 years in Joburg and then it came time for me to move on to the next chapter. And it's Yeah, it's funny how timing works out sometimes, but at exactly the same time that I told my boss I planned on moving on from South Africa, our director who had run Brawl's African operations for 21 years also um, decided to move on to his next chapter. So, I mean, my role at Brawl had always been very strongly focused on our clients across the continent, and I was always one of the, the more passionate for advocating for African real estate. So, it worked out well that there was suddenly this need within the business to manage our African countries um, using my existing experience in Africa, and I could do it outside of South Africa. So within 48 hours of, of unofficially resigning, I found myself planning to move to Mauritius, having never been there before. And, I mean, when I first took on the, the COO role, I knew that I, I probably wasn't the, the typical profile I actually I said to our CEO when he offered me the role, I said, do you, do you really want to put someone female, foreign and under 40 into this position? But I think it actually worked out to, to, to my advantage in the end. I mean, coming from an international background, I could take a more independent view of, of cultures and practices and the way that people worked. And having been to 118 countries, including half of the countries in Africa, I'm very used to finding myself. In, in new cultures and figuring out new places. So I had one year to dive into the new role before COVID hit, and then it became a matter of trying to keep businesses alive, um, as if working across 12 countries in Africa with 12 different markets and legal systems, currencies, foreign exchange policies and governments wasn't complex enough. We now had to deal with 12 different sets of rules on lockdowns as well all of which were, you know, changing rapidly. And I mean, daily, every day, it was a question of, is public transport running in Uganda? Or are staff allowed to come to work in Nigeria? Or are supermarkets open in Mauritius? Plus, of course, the the personal anxiety that all of our staff were feeling. I mean, you know, it was a lot. I, I always say that management is like a reverse waterfall. Problems flow upwards. So if you're the person at the top, you end up absorbing everyone's problems. Uh, but we all survived. And the one thing I'm most proud of and the way I like to work in any role in my career is to either build up a new service or division or take an existing business that's maybe not doing so well and restructure it into something that's sustainable. And that's that's what I enjoy, the, the challenge and the change. But while I'm doing it, I make sure that I also build up and develop an executive behind me so that once things are running smoothly, I can hand it over to them to run going forward. And so far, every time that this has happened, I'm quite proud to say that it's been a female executive who I've been able to lift up and hand over to. Um, I once said that as a female executive, if you have a seat at the table, your role is to create another seat for someone to sit next to you. So that's what I've always tried to do. Well, that's good to hear. Just being back home and now based in Cape Town as part of Cushman and Wakefield Brawl, uh, that business unit, 
What influenced you to come back to South Africa and maybe a little bit of insight of how long you've been back and what does your latest role entail? Yeah, so after my work in Africa, I needed the next challenge. Um, and I wanted to come back to my core skills of, of data, strategy, analytics and research, um, but with a more future-focused vision about how these things can be done. And that's exactly what my new role involves. It's about helping clients make decisions about real estate. Um, so whether that's a stay versus go or own versus lease or retail location strategies or highest and best use decisions. Um, but it's doing it in a way that combines data-driven insights with human intelligence. And to help support this, I am literally a week away from finishing my master's in data science, which has given me a good framework for how to tackle data and analytics and apply it to the real estate industry, which, of course, as we know, has its own uh, nuances and challenges when it comes to data. So, yeah, that's the new role. And it's within the Cushman and Wakefield Brawl team who I have huge respect for and loyalty to and in whose skills I, I really trust. I mean, I find myself looking around the room during a, a very difficult project and think, yeah, this is hard, but there's no one else I'd rather be figuring it out with. So I actually just moved over to Cape Town about a month ago and, yeah, very happy to be here. Uh, talking about the mother city, it's a no-brainer. A lot of people would want to stay in Cape Town or move to Cape Town with remote working and demand there, but it being such a beautiful city. But perhaps also it could be because it's uh, known as a cycling city that attracted you back. Am I pushing the envelope there? I understand just on a softer note, you're quite an avid cyclist and a sporty person. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's definitely not an accident or a coincidence that I ended up here. I actually spent a lot of time in the Cape last summer while I was training for the Cape Epic. And I loved it so much that that's kind of what convinced me to make it a full-time thing. So yes, you're right. Cycling is a big thing for me. Um, it started as triathlon, but it's now more uh, sort of mountain biking and gravel biking. But my favorite is actually bikepacking, which is riding across countries or regions or continents and I'll often use my cycling expeditions as a way to raise money for, um, there's a, an animal rescue charity in Joburg, which I love, called Paws the Rust. So my first big, big expedition for, for them was cycling 3,000 kilometres across West Africa a few years ago from Senegal, Guinea, Sierra Leone, Cote d'Ivoire and into Ghana. Um, but since then, I've cycled through uh, Mexico, all of Central America, from Guatemala to Nicaragua, uh, Cuba, all around the Balkans, Mongolia, Slovenia, my favourite parts of Canada. So, yeah, <laughs> living in a place with such a strong cycling lifestyle is is really exciting for me. But the, the only bad part is that I broke my ankle recently, uh, not on a bike, surprisingly. Um, so I'm busy with the rehab for that so I can get back out on my bike properly. Um, I definitely don't recommend moving countries while on crutches, but the fact that I did it just tells you how determined I was to get here. Well, I hope uh, you on the mend soon. And understandably, you mentioned all those countries that you've been to. That's probably also linked not just to your career, but your, your cycling uh, feats, as it were. Turning back to property again, tell us, uh, how did you get into the property industry? A little bit of where you grew up and, and some of what you studied. You, you mentioned now that you uh, about to complete your master's degree as well. Yeah, so I think nowadays, you know, there are property studies degrees and so there's a bit of a, a typical sensible pathway into property, but that's certainly not what I did. Uh, but looking back, I mean, all the pieces do end up fitting together quite nicely. So I grew up uh, my early childhood in Canada and later childhood in Australia. And I did my first degree in Australia, which was um, bachelor's and honours in mechanical engineering, which I loved, um, especially, you know, manufacturing processes. But then I moved to London. There's not so much uh, manufacturing engineering in, <laughs> in London. So I ended up <laughs> working in, in building services, you know, designing like aircon and sort of HVAC systems, which, yeah, I, I grew a bit bored of after a little while. Um, yeah, and I found a new use for uh, my sort of analytical and, and problem-solving skills. I always say engineering is a, a degree in problem-solving. So I ended up working in London for uh, 
IPD, which is now MSCI, which is a sort of investment research uh, company focused on commercial property. I worked for them in London, in Melbourne, and then in Joburg, and then moved over to Brol, where I worked in Joburg, Mauritius, Nairobi, now Cape Town. And I think if you look at all everything put together, yeah, it does sort of complete a picture in that mechanical engineering, I understand property as a built asset, as a physical asset. I have a master's in property, so I understand property as an investment asset. Um, I also have an MBA, so I understand the business of property. And now with the, the master's of data science, I think this is the, the future of property. So don't ask me why anyone needs three master's degrees. I still haven't figured that one out, but, uh, but there we are. It does complete a picture. Thanks for that insight, Jess. What advice would you give young women wanting to get into the property industry and becoming a successful exec like yourself? I think having a, a balance between sort of a generalist and specific knowledge is important. So yes, having wide ranging knowledge is so important and becomes really valuable in being able to sort of connect the dots, especially in any management role. I mean, you need to know enough to hold your own in an intelligent conversation with every facet of the business. You need to know enough about finance to talk with the CFO. You need to know enough about HR to talk with the HR executive. You need to know enough about legal to discuss with the head of legal. Same with you know, marketing or operations or IT. So broad knowledge is crucial, but so is deep knowledge. And so the one thing that I tell all my staff, and that's male or female or senior or junior, is to pick an area of your own interest, which becomes your specialist subject. I mean, I want everyone in my team to have an area on which they are our leader. Um, even if they're nominally the most junior person in the room, they're the person who is the expert on that particular subject. So maybe it's green leases or student accommodation or financial modeling. Uh, for many years, for me, that was African real estate. Um, it's now kind of morphed into analytics. Um, but having that one thing, that's going to position you as the go-to person whenever that topic comes up anywhere in the business. So if you can be clever to pick a topic that not only interests you, but also has future relevance, it's really going to open doors for you. Some valuable advice there, not just for young women, but uh, youngsters in general. Just to end off, Jess, where do you see yourself in, say, 2030? Will you still be based here in South Africa or somewhere else in Africa or perhaps globally? Is it too soon to ask because you just moved back? <laughs> yeah, so I, I do tend to look at my life in sort of five-year-ish chapters because you know, even if it's an amazing chapter, you don't read a book by reading the same chapter over and over again. There's there's no progression. And that's kind of how I felt about leaving Mauritius. You know, it was an amazing chapter, but uh, it was time for the next one. So yeah, you're right. I'm really just now starting the, the next new current chapter. But yeah, I mean, having grown up moving across different countries, I don't find packing up and moving to a new country so weird or intimidating. So heading off somewhere new is always possible, but <laughs> I've always said the only reason that I never moved to Cape Town before is because I figured that once I moved here, I'd never leave. <laughs> um, so for now, it, it really does have everything I want. Um, but yeah, I mean, a new chapter doesn't necessarily have to mean moving across the world. It could be anything, a, a new location, a new role, a new direction, um, yeah, and five years is when my current work permit runs out. So whatever's going on at Home Affairs at the time might also have an impact on what I do. Well, let's hope they get their act together and uh, sort things out if you do want to stay in South Africa. Jess, I appreciate your time on the podcast today. That was Jess Moyer, uh, Director for Strategy and Research at Cushman and Wakefield Brawl. Thanks for listening to the MoneyWeb Property Pod with Suren Naidu. To listen to more episodes, go to moneyweb.co.za or the MoneyWeb app and follow MoneyWeb News for daily updates. Follow Suren on Twitter at Suren Naidu for more of his property industry content and other business stories. The Property Pod. 
pod.